This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Live from Portland at RailsConf, we're recording a podcast panel crossover episode. I'm Gemma Isroff, one of the co-hosts of the Ruby on Rails podcast. I'll be moderating this panel. We have five podcasts represented here across eight panelists. We're going to go around to start and hear what all everyone is excited about for RailsConf. First up, we have Brittany Martin from the Ruby on Rails podcast. Brittany, what talk or workshop are you most looking forward to? I have to admit, I'm going to go with a meta answer and it's going to be this panel, but also as well, the Make a Switch track, which I ended up curating. We already saw Joel Hoxley give a fantastic talk as well as David Hill, and I'm just excited for that track to continue. Sounds great. Looking forward to hearing the rest of it. Next up, we have Robbie Russell of Maintainable Software Podcast. Hello, I'm enjoying so far the, uh, what is it, Talk to Me Like I'm Five or I forget the way it's titled. But yeah, the tracks there have been really great in terms of getting down to some of the basics and such. And so I'm kind of mandating most of my team sit in those ones in particular if they can. Which ones have you been to so far? I just sat in the Rails console one and I learned a few things that I didn't know about or had forgotten about, like using jobs in Rails console was pretty fun, having subprocesses. And there was one earlier on maintaining Rails applications. I really enjoyed that one as well. Next up, Andrew Culver from Framework Friends. Yeah, so for me, conferences are about people. And so I'm kind of notorious for hanging out in the hallway track. I'll attend a few talks, but mostly like for the limited time that I'm here, I come in late. I leave real early because I got kids that I got to get back to back home. But for the time that I'm here, I just try to have as much face time with, you know, everybody like who's in the room right now. Nice. Nick Schwader, Ruby on Rails podcast. I'll do two things. One, I like RailsConf for me is back. I'm just so hyped for it. Mm. I'll call out. I joined the Ruby community in first week of March 2014. I've never been to RailsConf. I've like followed the content for eight years. So it's such a treat to be here. I will, to honor your question, pick a specific thing. I'm excited to see the remote Ruby gang talking about a uh, pocket. Well, I won't spoil anything. I love our community, but seeing people not just carving out their niche, but like helping to grow more of things in the community to make it sustainable, to make it more welcoming and open to more people. And so I'm absolutely, as we say in the UK, buzzing to see uh, the Remote Ruby gang. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole community content track. Speaking of Remote Ruby, Andrew Mason. Yeah, what's up, everybody? I was excited for Joel Hoxley's talk, which is great. Joel, again, Joel's in the audience for anyone listening. I'm excited for Schwad's talk because Schwad always gives amazing talks. I'm always excited for Brittany's talk. Brittany's not giving a talk this month. So that's why I'm excited to hear her here. Uh, next up, Jason Charns. <laughs> oh my God. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like any answer I give now would just be cheating. I too very much like the hallway track and the people. I very much enjoyed Joel's talk. Dave Copeland's giving one I'm really looking forward to. The one I'm least looking forward to is the remote Ruby talk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I'm excited that Aaron Francis is here so we can talk about Laravel this whole time. <laughs> Laravel. Also of Remote Ruby, we have Chris Oliver next. I'm just so excited to like put faces to Twitter avatars and Discord and everything. Had conversations with so many people and then finally getting to meet them in person is the best. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. And we have Colleen Schnattler from the Software Social Podcast. I am super excited about my workshop, which is coming up in 45 minutes on <laughs> building an advanced query builder with Active Record. And there's actually quite a few Active Record talks here this week. So I'm super pumped for those. I'm really looking forward to it. So next question I have is why podcast? And maybe we can get into the community content track a little or, or what's going on there. Yeah, Brittany. So I love its ability to be a time capsule and it's so cool to have a timeline of my own career, but it's even cooler to watch my co-host's career. Nick's first episode was September 2018. He was a regular guest and then he became official co-host in 2021. And then Gemma's first episode was in March 2021 and then became a co-host also in 2021. And each have had like a really unique path to Shopify and establishing themselves more in the community. And I just... I feel really grateful that I have an opportunity to talk to them regularly about it. We feel grateful for the same. Remote Ruby, I know you're doing a whole talk on podcasting. Do you want to give us a little preview? <laughs> I'll let Andrew give the preview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
I think podcasting is a great way to kind of reach a very large audience without as much overhead as producing videos. So our talk is basically on how to start a podcast and it's tailored towards Ruby, but it's going to be about kind of our journey to starting one, kind of the lessons that we've learned. Because I've, at this point, I've been on three podcasts. Jason and Chris started Remote Ruby and then I joined them later. So I think we have individually a lot to share with the community to help them not fall into the same traps that we did. So that's our goal is to like help encourage people to start their own podcast and do it in a way that they can avoid some of the huge mistakes that we've made over the years. What are some of the mistakes? <laughs> it takes a team, in my opinion, to produce a great podcast from editors, from doing marketing, doing show notes. You know, there's so many aspects of it and having co-hosts. And if you only have two co-hosts, one person doesn't show up. What do you do then? You skip a week. I think consistency is really important. And it's kind of back to what I said about having a team. And when you don't have that team in place, it can really produce a lot of heartache and headache and a lot of after hours work on the podcast, which is not the goal. And it really detracts from the fun of it. Colleen, do you have a similar view on podcasting? So one of the things I love about podcasting is this concept of luck surface area. And it's this concept that the more visible you are, the more opportunities come your way. I'm a self-taught developer. And when I got into software, everyone's like, you should blog, you should blog. I could not get into blogging. I just could not get into a good routine. I didn't like it. And then I started podcasting. Random people on the internet listen to the podcast and then people recognize you and then they know you. And I have found for me, like professionally, First of all, I love it because I do podcasts with someone who I'm already friends with, but professionally, like opportunities start coming your way as you become more visible. And I think it's a very low friction way to become more visible. Andrew, yeah, do you have similar thoughts? Yeah. So for me, it's two things. We were already having conversations. So Aaron and I were already chatting. And so by just hitting record, they gave us this opportunity to kind of like share that I kind of had a sense like, yeah, yeah, people might find this interesting. What you can't, if for anybody that's listening, there are so many podcasts. Mm -hmm. We have friends like Justin Jackson and like his whole life is podcasts because there's so many of them out there. And so anybody that thinks that they have a unique take on something, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, start a podcast, just do it. Because what you can't know before you do it, before you start publishing, before you start sharing your ideas is who's going to come out of the woodwork. And yeah, we got like feedback from people that we knew, but we also met tons of people that we've never heard of before that reach out and say like, hey, I love that. And people that come up to you at conferences and say, hey, you know, that conversation that you had, I really identified with that. That really captured something that I had been thinking as well. And until you start publishing stuff, you can't know if that's going to happen. And it's so low friction, mm -hmm. like unlike blogging, which it takes a ton of time, we were already having the conversation. So you just hit record and you publish it. And then I think the other piece of it as well, which for folks who have guests on their podcast, it's amazing to think that you can provide infrastructure for super smart people, people that are way smarter than me. You can get them on. We had a guy say this to us recently where he didn't want to reach out to people and be like, hey, can I come on your podcast? But he said, but reach out every six months because I might have something to say. And so the idea that you can get an audience and then you can share with that audience the incredible thinking of people that may only want to do a podcast a couple times a year. That's another thing that I love about the medium. So the ability to enable others or to push others forward. Yeah. You mentioned feedback a few times, hearing from your listeners. I know that's something that it's tough to do as a podcast host. It's tough to figure out where your listeners are and how they talk to you. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Twitter. Twitter is the best thing ever. I live on Twitter. And so when you open your DMs, make it easy for people to send you messages. Yeah, just open that sucker right up. Robbie, have you had similar experiences? You know, Twitter is helpful. So I do encourage people to email me as well. My format doing more of like interview style and fairly consistent topics, but just a broad range of different people. So, but the angle that I, you know, in terms of communication, it's also, but it can be lonely as a podcaster and that you don't hear oftentimes we'll post stuff on Twitter and hopefully the guests will reshare that and their network or will help 
interact with that. But there's other areas I've found like some interaction over like Reddit. Sometimes I'll post the links there as well and try to use some controversial title for the episode just to kind of provoke people <laughs> a little bit. That tends to help a little bit as well. Those are some areas, but I do get a lot of emails and occasional DMs and stuff from people as well. Brittany, any thoughts? Yeah, for me, I used to have a very loyal listener who would tell me about how terrible my audio was. And I so appreciated them for it because I was learning. And then as I tweak things, I would have sessions with them. And then eventually when we hired a professional editor, he reached out to me and told me like how proud he was of me. And then he just really believed in the podcast. And so he held on for all that time that I was learning. But I will say to the greatest joy for me, I will echo Andrew, is when I'm on Twitter and someone will tweet an inside joke from an episode and bring it back. Like we get jokes about goo. We get jokes about treading water. It's really fun for me to share those jokes with those listeners. I think you can be the source of your own feedback as well. I say time and time again, like I'm the only one who listens every single week when our podcast listens, I listen to it. And that is a way for me to find errors in the way I speak. Things that I do when I speak, like um, like, and uh, and things like that. Also, is if you solicit feedback, kind of going back to what Robbie was saying, that's another great way to get it. And I will also say that when you get that feedback, it may not always be positive and it may not mean that you need to change anything. Not all negative feedback means that, oh, I should adjust this because this one person doesn't like the way we do this. I was just going to say on the like asking for people to do reviews, I found that if I kind of repeat that over and over, it's kind of becomes an echo chamber of nothing. It's hard to get reviews on Apple Podcasts and other places. I don't even know where else people are telling people to go anymore. Is Stitcher still a thing? Anyways, you know, sometimes I'll just kind of go a little off script and then I'll be like, or write something and some chalk on the sidewalk. And then someone sent me a photo that they did that. And they, so I'm like, oh, cool. I got a nice review on some sidewalk in someone's neighborhood. So thank you, whoever that was. Nice. And feedback's definitely a gift. It's taken me a long time for me to learn that in like most areas of life. like. Y'all listen to podcasts. I listen to podcasts. It's quite a big commitment to carve out a half hour, 20, 30 minutes, 60 minutes of your day, especially in a remote world where we don't commute. So we don't have that cheat code as often anymore. And so most people, if if they're unhappy, what do you do? You just switch off. So like how much does somebody care to actually, even if it comes off as quite terse with feedback, sometimes you can either be, well, if it's true, why are you offended? And if it's not true, then why are you offended? Because it's not true. It always stings for me. Any feedback and anything. This is not even just a podcast. But if you can try and wrap a kernel out of it and and make something positive, it might be one of the nicest things you hear. Switching gears a little bit, Chris Oliver, what do you love about the Ruby ecosystem? A lot. Probably the people the most. Aside from that, there's something about the Ruby ecosystem that started in entrepreneurship and the language itself is kind of like designed around humans first, which is unique and rare. So it's all kind of around people and stuff. Anyone else have thoughts here? Andrew Culver. So I think the thing that attracted me to the Ruby ecosystem like 10, 12 years ago now, it was tooling. And I think that comes back to what Chris is talking about, that it's a human, like Matt's is nice, so we are nice, like the whole Mina Swan thing. And then the way that that bubbles up, I think, into Rails, since we're at Rails Comp as a framework is the developer experience. It's like a framework that was developed with empathy for the way that you would interact with it. And that was different than a lot of what existed at the time. And I think other frameworks have taken inspiration from that. And we certainly don't have a monopoly on developer experience. I think we can look to other frameworks for inspiration there as well. But the focus on tooling, you know, it, it it's interesting. There's a why quote. I'm probably going to butcher it a little bit, but I think there's actually like a lesson to be learned from it. So one of the things that Y said toward the end of his tenure was software is so unrewarding. You write something and then a year later it gets replaced by something better. And then a few more years go by and it doesn't run at all. It doesn't run at all. There's an inverse way of looking at that quote. And that is that our stuff's always getting better There isn't a monopoly on anything and you can always propose a new, a better way. And we're the beneficiaries of that. And because there's that focus on developer experience that keeps driving us forward, Rails continues to compete. It continues to be like, I think it is still to this day, the best way to launch SaaS applications specifically. 
And so that's one of the things that I love about Rails and love about the community. It's that focus on people. What's missing? And we have a foremost Y expert, I think probably in the world next to you who is nodding along. So I think we can say that quote was all good. What's missing that next year or the next year or the next year we might see in the community, Jason? So they talked about Ruby Conf, but Andrew is talking about tooling, but like tooling's kind of stagnated, it feels like, in the Ruby community, Ruby ecosystem. And like they were talking about Ruby 3's focus is on developer experience. There are times I've considered not writing Ruby. I watch these other people work in languages and they can do amazing things like amazing refactorings and even things like suggestions. And I'm like, uh, I'm still writing the same Ruby code I'm writing five years ago. So I think that's something we can improve on for sure. And I think they're trying. So that's encouraging. I think this would lead into another Y quote from it's the similar time, which was, and I think this applies for our community today. If you don't create, you become defined by your tastes and your tastes can only alienate other people. So create. And I think that that's uh, something that we can, we have a mature ecosystem now. We can really be lazy if we want. And I think the Rails way is awesome. I think the Ruby way is awesome. I think we can now put the mantle on our shoulders and create, even if it's just fantastic, interesting new gems, be the content we want to see in the world. And that goes with podcasting. It goes with open source. I really feel what Jason's saying. And I think that part of that solution would be to continue to create new and innovative things. I think there's definitely a lot of room for that. We could definitely stagnate and make awesome SaaS apps, crowd SaaS apps all the time with Rails. But I think there's a lot more innovation and fun to be had. I think that's a call to action. I think that's what, for anybody that's listening to that, if that resonates with you, I think we're just scratching the surface of what we can do to make it easier for people to develop software. It's such a lucrative opportunity. I have like a physical product business as well. And the margins are terrible. It's so awful. And like when I sold my first SaaS business, the margins when we went through due diligence were like 95%. We operated at a 95% profit margin. That is an opportunity that we should be trying to give. And, and we haven't even scratched the surface of all the SaaS software that can be written with Rails. You can find a mission in it, in creating better tooling, higher levels of abstraction, greater developer experience and usability so that we can give these tools, the best set of tools to a greater set of people so they can improve their economic situation. A single person building a SaaS app can change their life. And I think we've got the best tool to give to people for that. Yeah, or even I would argue uh, enable people to build their own tools that can lift them up. Robbie, did you have a thought there? I'm going to go ahead on a little bit of a limb here and say that I, I disagree with everybody to an extent. I'm actually more interested in maintainable software, but thinking about as new tooling is coming out, I think it's great. We keep building new tools, but it actually becomes a problem for all of us software engineers where we're like, well, we need to upgrade to this new thing because that's the new thing that everybody's talking about. And there's not enough emphasis on like, how do I help take care of the stuff that was already working that our apps are already reliably working with, you know, our customers or our clients have already invested time and money into and like everybody chasing the next shiny new thing. And I'm like, what about the thing that's already working? How can we refactor that? How can we iterate on that? How can we make sure that those gems are getting more support maintainers? I've maintained and created an open source project. It's exhausting to take care of projects for a long time. And so I think we need more in the Ruby ecosystem, less new gems, more emphasis on helping participate and helping take over projects or just helping those maintainers push things forward or help offer to volunteer and things like that. Teaching people how to like, migrate these things, how to handle upgrades so that the next new shiny object isn't the thing that we're trying to compete with. I think the point one of my comrades over here was saying here was just, we're trying to make the developer experience great and we can be a little lazy and we are being lazy as a community at times. And I think we owe it to ourselves and to our future selves to take care of the stuff that we've already invested a lot of time and energy in. Yeah, Brittany. I think that's a really interesting take, Robbie. And it kind of makes me question, you know, in order to grow out the Ruby community, we have to do one of two things. We either need to introduce new people into the community who haven't been here before, or we need to try to reacquire the community members who have left for other languages and frameworks. And so the question is, if we make the software more maintainable, are we going to be able to coax back the members that we've lost in the past? Like, is it our job to educate how things are better and really are things better? Nick, the why quote you pointed to brought up 
tastes as being exclusionary. I wonder if anyone has thoughts in what ways are we as a Ruby community being exclusionary? This is maybe a crappy take, but Rails being the only web framework in Ruby sometimes feels a bit exclusionary. And like there's Hanami, there's Sinatra, but people associate Ruby with Rails and that's fine to an extent. Like I very much love Rails and obviously, but I do think there's value to be had from like having alternatives and being able to learn from other people and different ideas. I wasn't around for Merb, Rails merger, the Merber, but I think I would have liked to have been because they were like competing ideas that became one. And I think that would help push Ruby forward. Yeah, Colleen. So I think it's simpler than that. I do these weekly mentorship calls with junior developers and I usually get like 15 to 20 in a call and none of them are Rails developers. And I think because we need more junior level Rails jobs, people are going to go where the money is. We all need to make money. If you look, I mean, even as us, as we've hired people, we don't hire junior developers. We don't, especially in Rails. I mean, I know I'm being Rails specific, but I think part of that is because these applications are a little more legacy, a little bit older. You need to have more context. And so I feel like the problem is solvable at the basic level. And that's, we need to hire people that are junior. And to add on to that, here's a call to action to everyone listening. You and your company are in a position to argue for and to promote and to do whatever you want to call it to get more junior engineers into your company. And it's kind of up to management and the senior developers to create and prove that you can have an ecosystem where juniors can thrive. They can learn the way you do Rails. They can do all these things. But it really comes down to the people who are already in those positions to bring people into them, to throw the rope down back after you're done using it and pull up people behind you. And I really think we can say, oh, well, these companies need to change. But at the end of the day, it's the engineers in those companies who can facilitate this change. And we need to. Yeah. And like plus, 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 I want to give credit and I, I won't call out people unless I want to talk about it, but people at this table collectively have done so much to lift up juniors and give juniors opportunities and to give them a voice. And I'd say if you are listening to this and if you're listening to this five years from now, randomly in a car, if you're just an engineer, you can give a voice to this in your company. I was hired as a self-taught Rubyist and I got into the game in 2014 and it was the most isolating and difficult and painful time going from nobody's paying me to code to somebody's paying me anything to code in a difficult job. And if you are able to facilitate even just one person every two years, you're making a huge impact in the universe. And this is something like if there's anything, like if you want me to just give you shout outs on Twitter, if you do this for the good of the community, just an altruistic good is something that we definitely believe in. And it's great for the community. And thank you to all of you and everything that y'all have done for juniors over the years. Schwartz said he'll pay $100 per junior hire. <laughs> yeah, I will actually. Yeah, I will. I will pay your company $100. For those listening as well, another thing, if, if you're nervous about the idea of even bringing on your first junior developer, bring in interns. Do it once a quarter, build it into your team cycle, keep them there for six, eight weeks, time box it so that you know there's an end period. Tell them that you're not hiring them at the end of it. It's like a period that you're going to pay them for six to eight weeks. That way you're not on the hook for that awkward conversation when they say, do you want to keep me? Because you got to build in that kind of like those, that muscle of, because what ends up happening is you might hire that person. Then you think I won't have time for the next person. So I'm actually a big advocate for having a regular internship cycle so that your team gets in the habit of having people come and go, because it also helps you improve your onboarding experience for your new developers to your projects and build up that resilience amongst your team. That This is an expectation of the job, not something that we're going to think later down the road. So build in internships first, Start bringing in your junior developers. You can do that in parallel as well. But your junior developers have people to mentor immediately when you bring interns in. And so they're part of the process as well. And so that just levels everybody up. So at Texas, we'll be hiring two junior backend developers this summer. And juniors work well for us because we only hire seniors that are excited to mentor. I can't tell you how many times I have interviewed seniors that have been very technically savvy, but have clearly no interest in mentoring. And unfortunately, that just won't work for us. And so I think that's important that you have to establish that as a norm within your organization. Great. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Honey Badger. They are not only my favorite error and uptime monitoring service, but they've also added several awesome new features. One of those being the public status pages. 
So it makes perfect sense that your error and uptime monitoring tool can have a public status page for you to communicate any downtime outages with your customers. So whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, Honey Badger is there for you to help communicate any downtime or outages with your customers. Plus, they've also added SSL certificate monitoring. So like many of us use these days, Let's Encrypt certificates expire every 90 days. And if for some reason you're a week away from expiring an SSL certificate, they can let you know ahead of time so that you can take care of it without any outages for your customers. Plus, managing the errors and things inside of Honey Badger has gotten even easier with Honey Badger Actions, which you can use to automatically assign errors to yourself or another team member, add tags to different error classes, and more. And they also have batch actions, which you can use on the search results to help manage your backlog of work to do. So Honey Badger is the place to check out for error and uptime monitoring, and it's only getting better. So check them out at honeybadger.io. So Chris Winslet, a long-term Rails developer, is asking where is the front end going? What's happening to that in the future? Yeah, Andrew Culver. I'm sure everybody up here has like an opinion about this and it's very relevant. I think we're on the right track. I don't think that that excludes React, Vue, any of those other toolings. But I think if you go back to that original blog post about stimulus, this isn't exclusive to stimulus. It's a philosophy. It's the idea. What DHH articulated in that blog post, I think, is one of the most significant things written in the 15 years that I've been doing software development. It's more than that now. But in that, I think there was a fork in the road where a lot of people started going too far to the front end, too much running in the client. The answer to that isn't React is bad, Vue is bad, Backbone was bad, Angular was bad. I think of somebody that I know, military vet, saw an opportunity in government for a piece of software that needed to be built and he built it. It was really scrappy and it had Angular. And then at some point there was a new feature. And so he used Backbone for that. And then he used Ember. And then he used React because each of those was the best tool for the job of the thing that he needed to build. But it was like bolted on top of a traditional Rails monolith. And so I think the world that we're in right now, sort of canonically, in Rails with like Hotwire or Stimulus Reflex and Cable Ready, those get you, I think, 80%, 90% of the way there. And then if you still need, I work on apps with React bolted on top. I don't do that work, but I think that philosophy, pulling out the heavy machinery is the quote from the blog post. I think it's a a solid answer. Web components. That's where the front end is going, in my opinion. Why? Why? Because... Having this entire framework to do maybe this smaller thing, I feel like it's kind of going out of style. But what I think is coming more into style is this idea of atomic things that you can put anywhere and they work the same. I feel like that's the goal of just normal React components or something. like, oh, I can build this React component and I can use it everywhere. But that doesn't work in practice, really. It's the same thing with like a Rails partial. So I feel like we are trending more and more towards this idea of being able to like package the whole thing up and ship it. And then wherever it's shipped to, it has the ability to be configured to work in that environment. So I'm curious then, Andrew, do you feel that all Rails developers should be full stack? Yes, I do. I don't have a stiff opinion on this, but I think that something that wherever it goes, it needs to think of, I won't call anyone out, I'll say people like me. People like me who in the eyes of the law are full stack. People like me who run from CSS and JS, but we will write it and are happiest in the pure Ruby. But but, 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 but (laughs) we like that Rails can help us from the beginning build a thing. I need to concern myself with my business logic and the problem and the user and what I need to solve for them. And I need as little friction in the way. I'm glad that Rails has moved not just convention over configuration, but like having the support for all the ways that people want to build things. So if you had a friend who's an expert in a thing, they can build the thing on top. But we always need to make sure we support the ability to just build product. I mean, I'm very interested in the new tooling that's coming out, but maybe there's some front-end whizzes in here who disagree with me. But as long as we think of the the people who are full stack, but not really, but want to be one person builders, as long as we keep servicing that community, then I think we go. 
it's going to sound like I'm sucking up because he's on the front row. But view components are kind of a big piece for us, like at Podia of moving forward. The mm-hmm. thing I like find very fascinating about it is I actually, this, I'm going to be burned alive at the end of this. I actually kind of like React, but I don't like the JavaScript part of it but I like the idea of components. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. I like components. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And so I like the view component because things like sidecar assets where you can like attach JavaScript functionality style sheets. It's kind of isolated. You can test it. I'm not saying like build your app with a full design system beginning as we've learned how to use them. Like at Podia, it's been very valuable because now people like me who are like Schwad said, in the eyes of the law, uh, <laughs> considered full stack developers, like we can ship consistent interfaces and we're not as worried about how they look every time we're just rendering out components. And I really, I think that's just a good way we're moving as well. One thing I'll say on that with the few components, I've also found that there's anybody that, that's out there looked at it and they're like, oh, I don't think view components are for me. I think partials also answer, you know, some great questions. Like you can go very far just with partials. So you don't have to go to some crazy front end framework. We got a lot of tools on the back end, but it all falls under that umbrella of like HTML over the wire. I do think that that's a good place to be. Joe Mazzalotti is asking, how can we as open source developers or maintainers help invite more folks, especially those who are underrepresented to contribute to the open source community. Yeah, Brittany. I think it is inviting those guests onto the show. My first episode that I ever recorded with Nick was his first pull request into Rails. And we just dug into what that meant and how like he navigated it and discussing with the contributors and just really trying to lower the bar and make it clear that it's accessible to everybody. But also making it clear too, like you invite guests on that work on smaller projects. They don't have to be these large, big public projects. And then encouraging them as well, like after you wrap up that episode, hey, have you considered, you know, supplying this Ruby Weekly? They're always looking for content. So get your name out there. Yeah, I think another thing is like, you know, as a maintainer, there's a lot of things that are easy for you to fix that are quick. Just like intentionally not do them and label it as, a good contribution for somebody new and kind of work the process with them. If somebody's not sure how the flow goes, like have a whole kind of script of start here, work through it, write it down, like all the edge cases that you need to think of and leave those opportunities open, even though like you could fix it in five minutes yourself. It's nice to be able to have some of those, you know, left open on purpose. I think we need to do more with all of our employers campaign hard to donate substantially more amounts of money to the open source projects that you use. I'm not talking 500 bucks. I'm not talking 500 bucks a month. I'm talking like we're going to dedicate 50 grand to this project that we get substantial economic value from. I work on such a project, right? So I have an open source framework that people use on top of Rails and we have substantial financial backing on the open source side. And that doesn't all go to me. That goes out to like seven or eight developers that help me on a regular basis. One of them, it's the first professional Ruby he's ever written in his life. He's a English teacher in Japan. And so that comes from funding. And so I look at the projects when that was a commercial framework and I look at the libraries that we used to support and at 500 bucks a month to some of those projects that we were supporting, we were the highest paying contributor. That's ridiculous. We have to have a serious conversation. If we want to talk about getting juniors into open source contributions, we need to make a disconnect between open source being unpaid labor. We have so much money in the businesses that we're in. We're raising so much venture capital. We have so high margins. Let's donate more money to open source projects. And I'll just put in a little bit, a couple of thoughts. Number one, just write this down if, if you're not already aware, codetriage.com, and then just go look at it later. But if you're gonna mentor a junior with that, it, it allows you to pick a couple of repositories and pick settings and just like one pull request a week, it'll just get sent to your, your inbox. You can look at it. And maybe it's somebody who's been ignored for years and you can like dig into that and learn a bit more, but it's passive. First, you have to get that passive contributor experience going down. But what's the goal? Where am I trying to get with this as a junior or senior or an intermediate? 
well, I like this term and I use a lot privately, become an open source civilian. We're not all going to be full-time paid to maintain a thing or some people very luckily are heavily in that. But I feel like we all have a duty as to be an open source civilian. And it's more than just like, oh, I found a bug. It's like that passive work and maybe just pick a couple things to participate in. Now, to final, I think directly to your point, what can we as casters, besides me just saying two thoughts now, what can we as podcasters do to further that? I think we need to normalize that. I think we need to make sure that we do what we think people should do. And then we talk about it because I listened to podcasts for many years before I ever was on them. I lived in the country. I didn't talk to Rubius. So that really influenced how I thought about things. Like I remember I, I listening to Derek Pryor and Sage Griffin years and years ago on Bike Shed and what they talked about, two people, their opinions and how they acted in their life really informed how I thought I ought to talk and act. And, and we can do the same too. Say, oh yeah, yeah, that was just on blah, blah, blah repository. And I looking at this PR from a couple of years ago that I got in from Code Triage. We say that a couple of times, people will be doing the same. It lowers the barrier. It makes it just a few hours a month and it becomes a, a good thing you can do like mowing your yard. I was going to say that one other strategy, I, I created this thing called Omezi Show once upon a time and there's been a couple thousand people that have contributed to the main project. I don't know how that's managed to happen, but there's a lot, been a lot of participation from people. And I think that project makes it easy for people to participate for sometimes it's quite often their first open source project that they've contributed to. I didn't do anything intentionally. I don't feel like I have the secret sauce at all there. But one thing that I have seen work effectively for me and other people that are helping maintain the project is we've had universities reach out to us. We've had small groups reach out to us. And so when they're like, hey, we have this idea, we want to participate and help get involved in an open source project. Can we help contribute to Open Z Shell? We'll inquire about this and we'll be like, all right, well, cool. We're, we're going to end up working with like three to five people. We can work on like a project. Maybe there's some ideas we've had for a while. It's sitting in the backlog. We haven't got to go through and review those things yet or work on some new features or gut some features. When we do it in that sort of way, that's made it easier for us to kind of wrap our head around it because we're not then... So just saying, like, I think it's really important to try to help the individuals that reach out to you and want to contribute. But if you're listening and you're like, I want to contribute, try to maybe find a few people that you'd want to contribute together with. And then you can approach a project and be like, hey, we're a little bit more organized. We've got three of us. Someone's going to be a point of contact. This is what we're hoping to accomplish. This is our timeline. What can we work on? How can we help your project move forward? That makes it way easier for me as a project maintainer to figure out how I'm going to wrap my head around what the goal is. And again, there's like a time box to it. They're going to get something for their collectively, and then they're going to work amongst themselves as well. And so they're, you know, they're, they're able to help themselves. And that has been a helpful way for me to bring in people outside of the people that just individually come. We're going to take one more question before we wrap up. John Manel is asking, how can we make our development environment mimic our production environment, especially if it's quite complex? If somebody says Docker, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Docker. You can use Docker, but your battery will last for four hours. It's true. And I think we've always said that, you know, I've done episodes on this where we talk about having something like active deployment, where it's just baked into the framework. And I truly don't believe that we're anywhere near that. It is a really good question because I feel your frustration, John. Like it's really difficult to solve a bug when it's only something that's going to be present in the ecosystem that you've built in production. And let's not joke around. You might have a Redis going, Elasticsearch, a CDN. There's just a lot of stuff. And to try to clone that locally is really difficult. I'm going to take the position that I don't think Rails should solve that. I feel like if you're building out a SaaS, there's like patterns you can follow. And I don't feel like that should be baked into Rails necessarily. We've had Capistrano. We still have projects that we deploy with Capistrano. It works great for those projects. But we have a lot of ones that I'm like, I don't understand what happens when we push this stuff to a branch. Some magic happens. Someone else made that stuff work and I don't understand the pipelines. That's okay. I'm not answering your question, but I don't feel like that should be a Rails thing because I don't think we should have a strong opinion about where it gets deployed. But it gets back to the point around the development environment. Those are trade-offs that each of those organizations, especially larger organizations, if you've got an engineering team of 50 to 100 people, we just wrapped up doing our biennial Rebound Rails survey, community survey, and like growing is like 11% or something. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. 11% of teams are like 50 plus engineers right now, or maybe it's like 14% or something like that. That's a lot of people. A lot of systems are probably in place. And so it's not going to be like, oh, this is really great when it was like three of us on a team and we could all get everything up and running in like five minutes on our machines. Now it's like, how do we connect all these different systems? We have serverless stuff. What does serverless even mean? But um, so there's a lot of like challenges there. I think that those are trade-offs that each company is going to need to make in terms of infrastructure. And I don't know that developers should be always be the ones that are making long-term hosting solutions necessarily either, kind of make decisions for the organization. 
It's funny that Brittany said active deployment because in one of my first podcasts in like 2018, maybe 2019, we had a guest who talked specifically, he named it active deployment, I'm pretty sure. So it's funny that we're still having this conversation, even though I feel like the ecosystem is getting better and better. There's more and more services to deploy your app, like Hatchbox, Fly, Render. I mean, you can keep going and going and going and going. So I don't feel like deployment is getting harder. I feel like developers are complicating their setups more than they need to. And I feel like that's part of the problem. Also, my dig at Docker was a joke. I don't love it. I use it every day because of some of the complicated infrastructure stuff. So, Chris Oliver, any thoughts there? It's one of those things where as a developer, you don't want to have to worry about the operation sides of things. You know, if you could get away without Docker and just have everything running and you have your dependencies and all that, that would be awesome. But yeah, I think at some point somebody's going to kind of come up with a, an alternative to Docker that can probably mimic that a bit better. They're still solving a lot of problems on Docker itself. And I think eventually we'll see it. It probably won't come out of the Rails ecosystem itself. It's kind of more of a devops area to work in. And so I feel like we're oftentimes just consumers of that activity that's going on instead of creating those things ourselves in the community. So part of me just feels like, you know, waiting for changes to happen and stuff like that. One thing I want to point out, it's not directly related to what you're saying, but I think it's really exciting. And Chris didn't mention it because it isn't directly related. But I think when you look at Hatchbox, how many infrastructure companies can you think of all of those companies that are doing interesting infrastructure things that are bootstrapped? The only ones I can think of are Laravel Forge and you've got Hatchbox. And that baby was grown in the Rails ecosystem. And I don't think he's done yet. So I think there are exciting things happening in infrastructure, and I think that they can happen in the Rails ecosystem, and I think that can be a call to action to anybody that's listening as well. So we have very many calls to action, and that's a full cap. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our listeners always, and especially the ones who are present today watching this panel, and thank you to everyone on the panel for being a part of it. 